So obviously, thank you to the PR Council, uh, Renee, Sarah, Katie, appreciate you uh, having me, and certainly thanks to the folks at Edelman, uh, in particular Jay Porter, who really kind of helped us focus our technology, which was originally designed for the advertising world, uh, they kind of brought to light, you know, how we can use it in the, in the, in the comms world. So we're really pretty excited to kind of show you how uh, it all unfolds. So just to get us going, you know, in short, what if you could know the receptivity of client communications before they go live? You know, what if it wasn't a secret? You actually knew how that ad or how that comms plan was going to impact your audience. Dumpstruck's an AI platform that enables PR professionals to know upfront how that communication is going to be received and what audiences are going to be most receptive to it. And it's called facial coding. So we actually take over the camera on your computer or on your phone and analyze millions of data points as consumers are watching your content in a test environment to analyze exactly how they're feeling about it moment by moment as they're viewing it. So don't be too creeped out yet. It's a completely opt-in experience. So let me actually show you how it works. So we've actually partnered with several of the major participant panel providers that you guys are typically already familiar with. Lucid, Research Now, Synth, the same way as you do surveys, uh, focus groups, same, same type of audience. But what we do is make the focus group you know, feel fun, feel safe. We're about to do something extraordinarily intimate. We're about to take over your camera, which can be a rather uncomfortable experience. So you'll, the first thing you'll notice is a huge departure from our corporate branding. It's supposed to feel safe. It's supposed to feel fun. Um, and it's supposed to feel like an area, an environment that you want to participate in. So let's go. Dumbstruck makes surveys easy. We're going to take over your camera. Obviously, I agree. We own your soul at this point. Uh, and the first thing it's going to do is make sure I have an HD webcam attached. Hello, that's me. Um, the next thing you're going to know is you're going to detect to make sure I can see all the emotion data points on my face. Now we do something really clever here. We're going to ask the participants to click a series of seemingly random dots. What we're actually doing at the moment of click is taking a micro snapshot so that we can determine where their pupils are on the screen for a couple of reasons. Obviously, the creative one is obvious, but for what's called attention dispersion, which I'll get to shortly, and I can't see my last dot here. There it is. So now that my eyes are calibrated, uh, we're just going to play the video. Will you stay for practice, Mom? Uh, yeah. Now go kick some points! <laughs> Are you crazy? You love her! <laughs> Me? Catherine. Caution. Never use non-detergent oil or straight mineral oil in the engine, or damage may result. Can't choose your parents. Once the video completes, it's going to ask a series of survey questions because psychologically, the only way you can measure brand recall are things like surveys. So what was that an ad for? And it goes on and on and on. But the reason I actually stood up here like a stiff as that video was going on, because the technology will know if I get out of the frame or put a picture up or try to hide my face, it completely stops. So I needed to be in the frame the entire time um, so that the technology could continue to read my face. So the, the test would actually stop and it would say either fix the lighting or um, get back in the camera or stop trying to fool us or all those crazy things. So let me actually show you what was happening on the back end. And it's going to feel a little awkward for me, admittedly, but it's the only way that you guys can see it. Um, I stripped the technology out so you could see what's happening on the back end. Um, obviously, the participants don't see this. The first thing it does is identify I'm a male, thankfully, um, around the age of 30. And we actually get age and ethnicity and gender from the participants. But the reason we do it ourselves is because if the participants sign up incorrectly, we actually are able to flag them. 
So I'm going to make a series of very exaggerated emotions so you can see the speed of, of, what it, of which it's registering. So I'm going to smile, I'm going to frown, surprise, I'm going to make all sorts of awkward faces. And yes, this is completely uncomfortable, but it's the only way that you guys can actually see it. Uh, smile again, frown. But most people don't watch ads completely animated like that. They, they watch some, you know, resting still face, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, yes. <laughs> I'm mean, PR people, I'm very careful about my words right now. Um, even if I was sitting here completely still, and the reason I did these emotions exaggerated is that you could see the bars fly up. If I was sitting here completely still, which I will for a second, you'll see the tiniest little movements, and we're actually registering. And obviously it's registering a little sadness and a little fear, because obviously presenting in 150 people can be a little awkward. So that's why it's accurately uh, measuring my emotions. So that's what's actually happening uh, on the back end throughout the course of the ad. But there's something really complex that we've been working on over the last four years that's, believe it or not, even harder than uh, registering core emotions. So these are the six core emotions that human beings can experience through their face. There's joy, surprise, anger, fear, sadness, and disgust. Now this is not my timeline but a timeline of the Chrysler uh, Catherine Hot ad that we actually tested uh, in market for them. This is what we call a psychologically perfect mood line, meaning that joy increases over time and kind of peaks at the top of the video. Now we know from cognitive research that if joy increases in increments over time, it's actually much more impactful from a brand recall perspective than if you're joy experiencing joy throughout the entire video. So I'll turn kind of joy on, and, and it follows the same pattern. And you'll also see, and I'll get into this a little later, where the majority of the audience uh, being tested, where their eyes were focused, for two reasons. Number one, you can make sure that the narrative of the spot is uh, carrying the consumer all the way through. You can also see that if you're doing an auto ad and the money shot is the badge of the vehicle, but the creative director wanted to put a bird or a dog in the background, now you'd know that everyone is staring at the bird or the dog and nobody was paying attention to the badge of the vehicle at all. We can also tell you cognitively, based on this dispersion, if people are physically looking at it, but cognitively tuning out. Before I get into more of a kind of a PR focus, just to share a learning, we did a big test for AT&T. AT&T's been running end cards for the last 50 years. We were telling them that by the time people got to their promo, people were still staring at the commercial, but mentally thinking about something, somebody else. They're spending $20 million this quarter on an ad campaign, and nobody has any idea that they're AT&T ads. Um, so the reason I wanted to show this example to kind of bring it back to a PR environment, Chrysler tested this particular spot. Obviously, it had some, you know, to me, some innocent, you know, but it did have some sexual innuendos. And they, were, they wanted to know from a brand safety perspective if this ad would offend moms. Not only could we tell them that, no, the ad will not offend moms, but it performed in the top 5% of all ads we've ever tested. The reason Chrysler was so sensitive about this particular, particular test at that time is because this campaign was scheduled to launch right after they were uh, launched the uh, Dodge Ram Martin Luther King ad for the Super Bowl, which was probably not their shining moment. Um, what's amazing about this particular test, as we're constantly testing videos, we tested all the Super Bowl ads. And you know, before kind of the press got a hold of this and, and really reinforced to the public, probably not a great idea to use Martin Luther King to sell pickup trucks, we were able to tell them up front that this ad never should have ran in the first place. Not only do you have a completely opposite mood line, but if I turn anger and disgust, those spike at the exact moment people realize it's not some inspirational Dr. Martin Luther King ad, but it's a pickup truck ad, you know? So, um, Again, we would have been able to tell them, not only you probably shouldn't run this ad, but if you're going to run this ad anyway, here's the cuts that you need to make from this spot to make it somewhat uh, respectable. Um, so it's a pretty remarkable uh, test. What's really remarkable about, about this, and, and certainly focus groups have these, their places, and you guys all know that focus groups are definitely appropriate for certain points in time, they focus group the hell out of this ad. 
Um, but you know that there's so much bias and misinformation. Even when we uh, ask survey questions at the end of this ad, you know, were you offended by this ad? The majority of the people actually said they weren't. So, you know, psychologically, what, you know, enforced them to, to be afraid to tell the truth um, is, is kind of mind-numbing, but it's, it's clear in the emotional data that uh, this is not a spot that ever should have saw the light of day. Um, so from a crisis management perspective, you can imagine, you know, how uh, influential this test could have been had they run it uh, prior. So because our data is so complex and we map the emotional timelines, and that's one thing I should note, just because I'm happy at a certain moment in time, you know, that Catherine Hahn ad made me happy at certain points in time, just because I was experiencing joy at second six and experiencing joy at second 25, that just means I was happy at those two moments. It has no bearing on whether or not that ad was effective to me or not. So what we've actually done over the last four years, which, which was actually triple the time it took us to build the actual emotion engine itself, was actually map this back to the last 50 years of cognitive research. So we've identified all these patterns so that you can determine things like brand recall, purchase intent, based on human emotion. Um, and then again, because the data is complex, we wrap this up in a nice, easy to read kind of re uh, report. So let me come back to the PR uh, for a second. Because again, you know, this was, this was a world that was completely foreign to me. I've been in advertising, you know, 15 years, and it, and it honestly wasn't until I met with Edelman and Jay's team where they're like, dude, you know what this could do for PR? So again, kudos to them and, and wanting to share it with the entire community and, and, and share this knowledge. Uh, pretty forward thinking, but uh, coming back to the presentation for a second, what does this mean for comms? So you guys up front have the ability to test your communications to the point where you know up front who it's going to work with and why, what audiences, what age groups, what demographics, who's really the most receptive to it. So I've highlighted a couple different areas to just kind of paint with a broad brush of, of, of where you can use this. Think about crisis uh, and crisis management. Sometimes you have a apology that just throws fuel on the fire because it, it just so happened to be a, a terrible apology. Or imagine being able to test multiple apologies up front to actually determine which apology would be the most receptive in market. Uh, pretty powerful uh, stuff. From an internal comms, I mean, I worked in corporate America before I got in advertising, and you get these internal comms videos, and you're like, what was management thinking? I can't believe they you know, send something like that out. This is a way for, you know, the internal uh, marketing teams and internal comms teams at corporations to be able to test the receptivity of how people are actually going to feel about it uh, before they send it out uh, on, a, on a mass scale. Social content. Once you put it out there, you know it's out there forever. Imagine having the security to know that what you're about to put out there is completely safe before it ever sees the light of day. And again, human emotion tells you exactly, you know, how will people will feel about it. And B-roll, I mean, you guys are doing spots all the time. We can tell you what images and what B-roll is most receptive as you're getting uh, voiceovers um, over that particular content. So again, you know up front what's the most emotionally effective video and how people will actually feel about it before anybody sees the light of day. So I know I kind of got through that a little quick. Um, that was my intent. I kind of lose time <laughs> up here when I'm, I'm on, uh, under pressure. So I guess, you know, with that, um, I'll kind of open the floor uh, to questions. Great, great question. Um, it, does, it, it does not work well on text because um, the only way you can truly do text is actually have somebody reading it on camera. And people with text, you can flash text on the screen and you get some emotional responses, but you, people read at different speeds and it's not recommended. Just plain and simple, we, it's video. Um, we used to do it for photos, especially with the eye tracking. People wanted to know what part of their out-of-home advertising people were actually looking at or concentrating at. But at the end of the day, the real value we provide is 
emotions over a timeline, and you can only get that with video that's seven seconds or longer. That's a great question. At the end of the day, this is not a tool to replace creatives. Um, at the creatives really provide the essence of what you know, they're trying to communicate. What this tool allows you to do is, is magnify or bring the best vision of their creative to market. For example, you know, if you have three different alternate endings, we can tell you which one is most emotionally effective. If you have two of the exact same commercials but two different music tracks, we can actually tell you for sure what music track um, is more emotionally effective. So it doesn't, it's not a replacement for that, but certainly an additive. So is the mood graph generated using combination of factors? Love whoever asked that question, thank you. Uh, the mood is a proprietary algorithm that takes in account all of the emotions. It's mainly joy and surprise, which are two positive emotions. Um, we did mood because at the end of the day when we put these reports out, people just want to see how did my ad do? And mood is the best way, the easiest way to kind of um, look visually on how it did, but uh, mood is a proprietary algorithm that takes in the six core human emotions. Yes. Uh, I'm sorry, the question is, have you worked to test concepts versus finished product to avoid it failing test after, occurring in produ after incurring production costs? We currently test a ton of animatics um, to determine which commercial is worth producing. We just had a huge breakthrough because we uh, got our hands on the actual animatic that Budweiser used for puppy love to sell that into the client, which was the, the puppy with the, with the horse. Uh, and that was the first time we actually had the actual animatic and that we were able to test it against the finished spot. The results were profound. Um, a couple of amazing things happened during that test. Number one, the animatic joy and mood line matched up identical with the finished spot. But one thing that was uh, pretty amazing with that particular test, there was a spike in joy at the end of the animatic. We know from cognitive science that if there's a spike of joy in the last four seconds of an ad, brand recall goes up like 96%. It's off the charts. You want that spike in joy. But because Budweiser had no idea that human emotions were, or humans were feeling great about that particular spot, they cut that section out of the Super Bowl ad. So they were sitting on the money shot and had no idea whatsoever that um, they should not have cut that out of the ad. So, uh, we test animatics all the time. We're doing several for a big financial firm right now where they're, they gave us five animatics and we're telling them which commercial they should uh, spend their money on producing. How fast can you get content tested and analyzed? Um, another great question and, and, and you guys know better than any in crisis management, hours can be an eternity. Our tests are done uh, from the time we launch it with the video in several hours. Uh, we have uh, a thousand plus participants who have responded uh, in several hours. It takes about a couple days after that to give you a report, but if, you know, if there's a crisis and you guys want to test to, to see if new content is going to change perceptions, um, we can have that data in hours and you can get on the phone with our data scientists and we can, we can actually just give you a verbal of what that is going to look like. Hey Jeff, I, I have a question um, relating to the variables. Sure. Um, when someone's watching, account for other things going on in the room rather than just them focusing on the commercial itself. Two parts to that question. It's only the face, but what's interesting is you don't know if that person is happy at that particular point in time because his kid just hit a home run yesterday and he's thinking about that. So there are factors that um, alter emotions and that's why it's important that we get an ag a, a big aggregate sample size. 500 is about the magic number. Um, I also got a, a great question here. Was the Dodge uh, truck ad tested after the bad press? It was tested before the bad press and after the bad press. 
um, we actually did a survey question and scraped out all the people that had um, seen the ad previously. Believe it or not, 73% of the people had not seen the ad previously. Um, and we got the same results. We got the exact same results, which, which is pretty remarkable. So how fast can you turn around a crisis response? You have a built-in audience, panels, or seminars. So again, the tests are done in hours. Um, we have a million people in our panel through partnerships with Research Now, Lucid, and Synth. The last thing I wanted to do would be in the participant panel business, so we might as well just go with the, the folks that do it well anyway. Um, so it's, it's several hours. We have a million in our panel, but we can retarget people who have uh, seen previous ads, if you'd like, if that made sense for that particular communication. How do you set a baseline? If not, how do you account for outside factors that impact the mood? I laugh at this question because I actually have a resting angry face. Um, I have a slightly upside down uh, resting mouth, so all my friends are like, dude, what's the matter? I'm like, nothing. Um, so as the, the, the second before the video starts, we do what's called a baseline. So however their face is on the frame at that resting moment, that baseline's out. So even my resting, sad, angry face, if I get the slightest twitch, and, and that's another thing that's a, really important to recognize. It's not the mouth that's just determining that I'm experiencing joy. Because again, I don't watch an ad like this. Nobody watches an ad like that. It's really all the other features, all the muscle movements around the eyes, around the forehead. That's how we can tell you're experiencing joy. That's how we can tell you're experiencing anger or fear or frustration. Um, it's, it's really, you know, all those slight muscle movements. It's the machines that are picking this up. You know, you program the machine with, you know, 5,000 people that you know are happy at that moment and the machines pick up subtleties. Oh, when you're angry, the pixel under your right eye gets dark for three seconds and all these obscure things that people can't see. Um, so that's where, where the emotions come from and that's how we know they're spot on. Can you do multiple people simultaneously? How about a real-time dashboard for the panel of people? Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly, ev everyone is done simultaneously. Nobody's done multiple people in the frame. It's only one person because you're one person in front of your computer or one person in front of your phone. Um, but this test goes out to 500 to 1,000 people and they're all done simultaneously. It's whenever they get the test in their email box and they have the time to take it. Um, no dashboard for the panel. We want to make it easy for them as possible. If they're having problems with the test, there's a little intercom button and we do, you know, for when we test a thousand people, you always get a dozen, oh, my camera won't turn on because they don't see the Google allow your camera to work button. Um, but outside of that, because our process is so sleek and simple and fun, we don't have too many problems. And the other thing that I should mention is the reason I'm kind of standing so, or I was standing so awkward during the video, we built uh, an incredible amount of internal tools to make sure that the lighting and everything is perfect. So not only will the test stop if I get out of the frame or if I hold a picture up or if I do anything weird, but um, we actually scrape the data and only um, rec record the emotions of people with the clearest frames and we continue to run the test until we have completely authentic, beautiful quality HD uh, reactions. So there's no bad data in here. Jeff, this is a game changer. Is there any, um, any case studies that you could cite of a client that you could share with us who have used this successfully and it's either prevented them from making a mistake or has uh, allowed them to justify uh, the work that they've yeah, the two that I can talk about were the, were the two that I just shared. The reason we tested the Catherine Hahn ad, as I mentioned, we were two weeks off of the Martin Luther King spot. As you can imagine, the CMO was on the hot seat. They were actually going to bag this campaign. This was an amazing campaign. Catherine Hahn, five spots. Again, some innocent sexual innu innuendos, but who knows, could have been interpreted. They were going to bag the whole campaign. They run the test from Dumbstruck. And keep in mind, you know, we're a small company ba based in upstate New York, and here we were, the, the, the fate of this $20 million campaign that was about to be bagged. Um, the CMO actually presented Dumbstruck's findings to P Chrysler's public company board that, that uh, not only were the ads not offensive, but 
they performed in the top 5% of all ads we've ever tested. They ran them. For, uh, two days later, they're on the cover of all the trades of what cute ads they were, and, and the follow-up research was amazing. Uh, the other one I can talk about is what I mentioned, AT&T. They run five tests. You know, 50 years they've been doing promo end cards, and nobody has any idea that it's an AT&T ad. So, I mean, how much money are you just throwing out the window? Sure. Thank you. Just for fun, I think it would be interesting if you if you had a, a, a research study that looked at PR professionals and our ability to predict what other people would or wouldn't feel. Because I feel intuitively, not having been part of the Chrysler, you know, or the Dodge program, if I had seen that ad, I would have counseled my client or my internal client that, that was a bad idea. Sure. And I just think it's kind of fascinating, and I, I, I think this is amazing, and I'm, I'm really interested in it. But that we need to have technology to kind of tell us what many of us in this room probably already know. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a totally valid point. We're actually, um, this again uh, prompted us, uh, because we're always testing ads, because eventually you know, Ford will call us up and say, I want to know how our ads stacked up against Chrysler and Dodge and all the other ones in the first quarter. How did our ads do? We're actually in the process of running all the attempted uh, crisis response videos from all the recent um, you know, not so great stuff to determine the benchmarks of you know, what's a good response and what's a bad. You know, again, I gotta give credit where credit's due and it's really you know, Jay and his team that you, know, you can take a whole bunch of responses and really write the cadence, really write the, write the playbook for how you should manage you know, crisis response. It's, it's pretty incredible. Thank you. Thank you.